my name is Sanjay Sareen. I'm based in New Delhi, and I'm the Vice President of Access at Prime, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics. I'm joined here today by James Hazel. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, James? Yes, uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, my name is James Hazel. I'm a Research Program Manager at the Access to Medicine Foundation uh, based here in Amsterdam. Uh, great to be here with you today. Well, as part of the Global Week for Action on Non-Communicable Diseases, we are here today with James uh, to discuss market barriers to the adoption of NCD diagnostics in low- and middle-income countries. This video is part of a series to explore multiple facets of NCD diagnostics in LMICs uh, to mark the launch of FINE's new NCD program. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you again uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, very excited to, to have this important conversation. Uh, as the research program manager responsible for the Access to Medicine Index, I focus primarily on uh, 20 large innovator pharmaceutical companies, uh, but I think we've learned a lot of lessons in terms of market barriers to access uh, that are uh, highly applicable to diagnostics. So I'm really looking forward to having this conversation uh, with you today. Um, before I, I dive in, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could give a, a little bit of a brief overview of, of some of the uh, market barriers that, that specifically um, affect diagnostics, and, and then maybe I can uh, talk a little bit about uh, parallels in, in the uh, pharmaceutical uh, therapeutics uh, sector. That's, that's a great way to start, uh, uh, James. And I think from my perspective, you know, when you look at a technology or when you look at the challenges around adoption of the technology, it could you know, potentially be either an access issue or a technology issue. Right? Typically, we have seen diagnostics as something which is always at the tail end of the spectrum. Uh, I think it's COVID notwithstanding, I think there has been a you know, lot of light that has you know, suddenly been on the diagnostics. It's really front and center. Uh, so we would really like to perhaps talk in the context of that and you know, maybe some of the challenges and, and some of the best practices you know, from the adoption of medicines in the LMICs and the extent to which they can potentially be applied to diagnostics. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so I, I think if you, if you look back uh, toward the, the start of the index, uh, you know, uh, in 2008, I think you saw very few companies uh, looking forward and, and planning uh, for access. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, over the years, I think we've, we've certainly seen a, a move in a positive direction. I think we can start maybe, maybe the conversation a little bit uh, from, a, from a research and development angle uh, and then sort of pr progress into implementation. Um, from an r and perspective, um, we've been encouraging companies to, to plan for access uh, both, both very early uh, in the process as well as uh, systematically integrating that um, uh, at a high level uh, within their corporate structure. Uh, so as far as diagnostics go, uh, we get a lot of examples of, of access plans um, from companies in our work, uh, some of which uh, actively incorporate um, diagnostics into the access planning. I think that's something that, that is very important. As you mentioned, diagnostics often um, a, a critical link in, in the healthcare delivery chain that is, that is often overlooked. I, I think another um, important aspect when you're talking about research and development and, and you know, whether it's a technology versus an access issue is, is really um, whether R&D is occurring to, to adapt uh, therapeutics or diagnostics to, to patients uh, in LMICs. Uh, as you know, often um, uh, when this R&D takes place, uh, you know, companies are looking toward high-income markets, and, and, and in, in some cases, um, you know, those adaptations that would benefit those uh, in LMICs uh, can be overlooked uh, in that environment. Um, and so, really, we look to, to companies to, to engage in, in creative solutions to overcome those barriers. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, partnerships with, with academics, with NGOs, and, and, and others to shift those incentives uh, and allow that important work uh, to occur. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, from an R&D standpoint, uh, are, have, have there been any mechanisms that you see that are, are, are very successful in, in terms of maybe shifting the tide and, and the attention to, to uh, patients in LMICs? You know, I think, uh, James, you make a really good point about uh, this early planning as far as uh, R&D is concerned, because a lot of times, you know, what we essentially end up doing is that we design these products, and these products may or may not fit the needs of uh, the patients in the LMICs. And you know, some of the work, for example, that we're trying to do at FINE now is to see that how we can incorporate, as you said, this diagnostic planning you know, very early on uh, into our tech and dev function. So as a part of that, what we are essentially doing is that we are commissioning these uh, you know, voice of customers, we are doing these value and preferences service surveys, where we're interacting with the customers, we're also interacting with the actual users of the technology. So I think just to understand the fundamental causes behind, you know, what are the challenges around adoption of these technologies, 
And what we have seen, as I was sort of alluding to earlier, is that you know, oftentimes it's either an access issue or a technology issue. So when you talk about an access issue, it essentially means, you know, for example, the technology is there. For example, let's take, uh, you know, let's consider BGMs or maybe even the HVA1C meters. The technology has been there for maybe decades now, but we see very, we really see a very low adoption. So is that low adoption because the users are not comfortable with the technology? That basically goes towards the ease of use of technology in the hands of the user. Or you know maybe you know there is not enough evidence which is available uh, from a performance standpoint, uh, which can be used by the policymakers to drive the adoption of that technology within their programs. And sometimes it's a pricing issue. Uh, and, and and again, going to the context of uh, a blood glucose meter or, or maybe a HbA1c diagnostic, despite the fact that these technologies have been there for a number of years, I think there are still significant price barriers for the lower strata of the populations in the LMICs to adopt these technologies, especially in public health settings. And when you talk about countries like India and Indonesia or, or Cambodia and maybe some of the other LMICs in the African setting, you know, if a technology has to be adopted in a public health program, the cost essentially has to be really, really low uh, so that uh, the programs are then able to offer the technology free of cost. And you know, sometimes there isn't enough attention which is paid uh, towards uh, the pricing of these diagnostics. And then the other pieces are that how, what is the technology, technology adoption pathway uh, for a particular technology in a specific country. And we have a lot of learnings from the work that we have been doing in tuberculosis and more recently in COVID where uh, a lot of countries, they will look at either a WHO policy or they will look at in-country uh, evidence, uh, despite global evidence, before they can actually adopt that technology. And I think some of the other, and if I, if I were to pivot a little bit, uh, uh, you know, from a technology angle, a lot of times the technology itself is not suitable for adoption. I mean, for example, you're trying to fit the technology in a primary healthcare setting, but the technology is too complex, uh, let's say, for a healthcare worker to use. Or if it's a platform-driven technology, like most of the HPA1C machines today, you have the issue of continuous power supply, you have the issue of not being able to you know, store the reagents or the chemicals at the room temperature because they require refrigeration. And oftentimes in countries like India, the temperatures can go as high as 47 degrees. Uh, so I think uh, those are some of the considerations which we are, you know, sort of, you know, trying to keep in mind while we're looking at, you know, the learnings from our communicable disease programs to see how some of these can potentially be applied through the adoption of NCD diagnostics in LMICs. So I, I think that was a great summary, and I think it illustrates, um, you, you know, when talking about uh, barriers to access, they can be very different depending on, on um, the country or, or the, the region in which you're talking, uh, talking about. It could be a, a pricing issue. It could be a health system issue. It could be a regulatory issue. So, um, you know, obviously some of those things, um, uh, many of those things are, are, are problems that require uh, a, a variety of stakeholders at the table. An important one is, is the companies that we, we have oversight uh, of at the Access to Medicine Index. And, and what we really do uh, is encourage companies to, to take a very case-specific approach, really to understand local context. And so what are, what are companies that are doing that well doing? Uh, they're, they're looking actively for, for local partners uh, as well as uh, multinational partners. Uh, but, but but really, uh, what what they're doing through those local partnerships is ensuring that there is um, uh, autonomy and, and decision making that is that is within country uh, and, and not more more external. Uh, other things that, that companies are doing well relate to health system strengthening. Uh, and, and when I say doing doing well, what I mean is is uh, health system strengthening that goes above and beyond maybe the the products in a company's portfolio. So so engaging in activities. Uh, such as training of, of healthcare workers uh, and other things that translate a, a across diseases. Um, uh, and, and finally, I think uh, to, to, to your point about uh, integration, um, I, I think um, one thing that I'm very optimistic about um, is, is seeing programs that were initially uh, set up uh, potentially decades ago for, for HIV or other infectious diseases. Uh, now being uh, expanded to, to new disease areas, including uh, NCD uh, diagnosis and treatment. Um, and so I'm excited to see as those programs expand to, to more NCDs and, and more countries uh, what the evidence says uh, re regarding um, integration. But, but I'm, I'm very optimistic from, uh, from a cost perspective, obviously uh, cost-effective 
to, to diagnose and treat early uh, rather than later uh, to, over, uh, to, to lower cost overall in the health system. So uh, very excited uh, about some developments there. Uh, is there anything uh, p potentially on your radar that, that I might have missed that you feel um, diagnostics manufacturers are doing very well? Yeah, no, I think you covered it pretty well, uh, James. And, you know, a, a lot of times, for example, you know, you may have the right technology and uh, at, the, at the right tier of healthcare uh, so that it fits in there. But, you know, oftentimes you're still not able to, uh, you know, sort of uh, advance the use of that technology for the intended populations or within the intended settings of use. And I think you made a great point about, uh, you know, training of healthcare workers. Uh, and, and this is something which we saw that even when you're dealing with the simplest of the technologies, you know, for example, if you have a rapid diagnostic test, for example, uh, for, for a COVID uh, infection or, you know, even for malaria, which has been there for ages, uh, it, it is not going to be, you know, giving uh, the desired results unless it is used appropriately. And, you know, one of the, one of the uh, you know, channels which we are, for example, exploring within FIND is that how do you advance access uh, to diagnostics to the last mile. You know, while there'll be patients who will be coming Dead to witches. the, you know, primary healthcare centers, but in oftentimes, uh, uh, oftentimes and in a lot of LMICs, you see that the average distance that a healthcare, that a patient has to travel, you know, from the place where they live to the place where they can access care is, is often, would, would probably take them an entire day, you know, lead to loss of livelihoods and all of that. So, so how do you then take the diagnostics closer to the patient? So we are exploring this channel of working closely with the community health volunteers. Uh, and, and, you know, there are scores of these CHVs in LMICs and they're being used for communicable diseases like malaria. Uh, and so we are, for example, trying to see that how some of these uh, community health volunteers can potentially be used for COVID testing. Uh, we have, you know, for example, right now interventions ongoing in Kenya and a few other countries. And we are also trying to couple that with very simple to use digital tools so that they can you know, quickly capture uh, the desired patient information and are also able to interpret the results and then transfer it to, to sort of a national database. And I'm sure this is an approach which can potentially be applied to the non-communicable diseases when you have a technology as simple as a blood glucose meter, maybe a healthcare worker is actually able to go down into the homes of the people and be able to sort of, you know, very quickly test and, and then see how they can potentially be linked. So I think that's another very interesting facet that we are trying to explore and find. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts around that. I think um, uh, health system strengthening is, is an important component. Um, I, I agree completely with you that um, uh, training of healthcare workers uh, is an important piece of that, uh, that, uh, as I mentioned previously, I think um, can be translated beyond the, the products in a particular company's portfolio to skill sets that, that are applicable um, uh, across disease areas uh, and, and into the, the diagnostics uh, space as well. As we, as we uh, near, near the end here, Sanjay, I, I did want to make sure that I uh, ask you, uh, before we get into recommendations sort of path forward, um, implications of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're, we're still uh, obviously in, in the midst uh, of COVID-19. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, for, from my standpoint at least, we've, we've seen uh, that there are both uh, obviously negative, but also some positive developments that, that have come out of the pandemic. I think, as you alluded to earlier, an increasing awareness of the importance of, of, of diagnostics uh, ha has come out uh, as a result of, of, of the pandemic. But I think one other thing that we've seen is an increasing willing, willingness of, of pharmaceutical companies to engage in, in collaborations um, with, with uh, others who may have been viewed as, as competitors in the past, but, but now through, uh, through the, the activities engaged in during the pandemic um, uh, are becoming more of a possibility. And so I'm hopeful that, that those uh, sort of collaborations can be expanded in, into the NCD space. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, from your standpoint, um, COVID-19, how has that changed the thinking around diagnostics? Yeah, so James, as you rightly said, I think there are both, uh, there have been a lot of negatives, you know, unfortunately, because of the impact of COVID-19, obviously, on the health systems in general, you know, there being, you know, entire healthcare machinery is being diverted towards management of COVID-19 and the care for other diseases, including HIV, uh, TB, malaria, and a whole bunch of NCDs getting completely neglected. People, people not able to come out of their homes because of these, you know, massive and strict lockdowns that has also sort of further compounded the issue. But as you rightly said, I think it's, it, it is perhaps good to look at it as a glass half full uh, and then look at the positives. And, you know, one of the great positives obviously has been the, this, 
this complete focus around diagnostics. And the other piece is, as you very rightly said, is the willingness of uh, the pharmaceutical and vaccine manufacturers and diagnostic manufacturers to be able to work uh, with each other. Because unless you're able to test, you know, you're not able to obviously put people on, uh, on treatment. And I'm, I'm really hoping that there are some interesting parallels and, and learnings that can be drawn from these, uh, from these interventions. Because it is not just the, the manufacturers of diagnostic products and the, and the pharmaceuticals and the vaccines who need to work together, but it is also within the health ministries, you have you know, certain people who are taking care of the diagnostics piece, and then there are, there are others who are responsible for drugs. So maybe also, you know, perhaps this can also bring some collaborative thinking in the context of the patient, that how do we make it better for the patient? And then I think the other positive aspect that has come around is that there have been these huge investments in diagnostic infrastructure both for communicable and non-communicable diseases. And we are, we are really hopeful that, uh, that, that the countries and the policymakers can look towards model, innovative service delivery models where you know, integrated care can be offered to the patients. For example, let's say when a patient walks into a healthcare facility, yeah, there is opportunistic screening, for example, not just for the symptoms for which the patient has walked in, but maybe for some of the other priority diseases within that geography or you know, for example, there could be a risk factor as far as that particular patient is concerned. So there have been, you know, numerous numerous examples and, and a lot of positives from uh, the, the pandemic. And, uh, you know, uh, this would be really cool, you know, if, if some of these interventions can potentially be leveraged for management of NCDs. Definitely, definitely. And, and as you were saying that, I think yeah, I was checking all the boxes in terms of some of the, the recommendations and conclusions about, uh, you know, expanded partnerships uh, and, and collaborations there. I think I will um, conclude by saying I'm, I'm also optimistic as I, as I mentioned about the, the, the possibility of taking these, these more vertical streams of funding that have historically been very disease specific and, and really looking for opportunities to translate them more horizontally uh, across disease areas um, and, and uh, in order to have sort of lasting uh, health system strengthening effects. Um, so overall, I'm uh, very optimistic, uh, but, but more work to be done for sure. Uh, thank you again for, for inviting me uh, today, Sanjay. Uh, I think this was a, a great conversation. Thanks, James. Uh, and this, it's been wonderful talking to you. And I think uh, you raised some really, really important points, uh, which I think are important uh, from, a, you know, from a perspective of you know, uh, looking at NCDs and how some of the parallels can be drawn from our learnings from other diseases and, and some of the other programs which are being implemented by partners. And, and we are not only looking forward to you know, having you for the panel on the 9th, but you know, also potentially looking at ways how we can continue to work together, and and, and maybe see you know how some of uh, you know the best practices we can find, and, and your organization could potentially lead to better access for diagnostics and medicines. I agree. That that sounds great. Thank you, Sanjay. Thanks, James. <laughs>